Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, Facebook Live. It's great to be here. It's uh, 4 o'clock or so on the East Coast. Uh, we had to change the time today. I was flying in from the SAR, the uh, Society of Abdominal Radiology meeting in uh, Orlando, where I was there for a few hours and gave a talk with Linda Chu this morning on uh, deep learning and some of the aspects of that relating to pancreatic cancer. So since last time I spoke, two things happened. I did get a haircut, as some of you probably noticed, and uh, my uh, grandson was born, Samuel uh, William Zember. So that's very exciting. And uh, mother and child are all doing well. The rest of us are hanging in there. Um, anyway, so let's get to the topic today. And the topic today was CT protocols. And there's a number of reasons I, I chose this topic. One, uh, when Lily asked me for a topic, I couldn't think of anything else, so I came up with this. But uh, the reality is that CT protocols are always something we talk about. I've mentioned in the past that when I run our CT courses, I always have the first talk is on protocols, which kind of puts things in perspective. And I make the point that regardless of the application, be it pancreas, liver, kidney, spleen, whatever you're doing, <coughs> At the end of the day, your ability to detect disease and classify disease, stage disease, look for interval change, manage disease, and the like is all based on your protocols. And we know that, and so uh, you know we've, we focus on that a lot, but in giving the talk today at the SAR, it reminds me to remind you about another thing. As AI comes along, as things like deep learning impact our ability to detect disease, classify disease, quantify disease, so much of it relates to the correct protocols. So one concern you might have is if we develop a really good algorithm for detecting pancreatic cancer, uh, and it's based on dual phase imaging or based on high quality studies, and if you do crappy studies, will the algorithm work? Well, there's a chance it will not work. That becomes very important. Things like radiomics are being developed to be able to detect normal from abnormal tissue, be it cancer versus normal tissue in the pancreas or cancer versus autoimmune pancreatitis. But when you look at it, so much is dependent on the protocol. All of these new techniques and technologies are going to be very much protocol driven. So though in the past we really have emphasized the protocols, because we knew it was how you detected disease and how you stage disease correctly. It's more than just that. Now it's going to be everything that relates to AI. And if you're not doing the protocols correctly, you're going to fall way behind. We also know, and I've spoken about this in different talks, that by looking at specific protocols, we could determine, based, for example, on lesion vascularity, and this is true in renal cell and now in liver, whether certain chemotherapies will work for you. One of the things that we are looking at is that, you know, how do you know chemotherapy does work or doesn't work in a specific patient? And how do you know which one to choose if you have several choices? If you have only one choice and this is it, take it or leave it, that's one thing. But you'd hate to give it to someone if it's not going to help them. But surely if you have three choices and you don't know what you should do first, how do you know that? Well, there's some work we're looking at. There's some work other people are looking at where you can predict whether patients will respond to specific chemotherapies. So now it's not just detecting disease, but the protocol and the vascularity in the protocol will be in renal cell carcinoma, for example, determine whether the tyrosine kinase inhibitors will work or not work. So now you got to say to yourself, if you don't do the protocol correctly, you're not going to be able to manage the patient correctly. And I think this may be a much bigger push on all of us to make sure we really have the exact protocols because all of these things, whether it's deep learning or radiomics, whether it's selecting the appropriate chemotherapy, whether it's looking for interval change, particularly with immunotherapy, this is all going to be based tremendously on how the study was done. We talk about immunotherapy and there's so much going on in the immunotherapy field and the opportunities and possibilities seem to be pretty much endless. But the question is going to be, we know this now with some of the new immunotherapies, the lesions become necrotic and become bigger before they get smaller. Well, if you only measured size, then you would say 
there's no response. In fact, tumors progressing through chemo, while in fact the patient's having a terrific response. So one of the things I'm sure you've read about and we can discuss at a different time is the fact that chemotherapy and our way of measuring the rhesus measurements, which is size measurements, it's bigger, it's smaller, 20%, 10%, 40%. But if you tell me a tumor is going to respond by becoming necrotic, and the truth is response, the more necrosis, the better the response. And the fact is early the tumor will grow or apparently grow because of this necrosis, rather than simply shrink, our ability to think about things really needs to be different. So I think it's very critical that we talk about that and we really evolve our protocols even stronger. Also, the fact is that it seems to us, surely in pancreas, that the multiphase are critical. But how many of you are you routinely doing multiphase? There's some work by Sigmund Park in our group now where she showed cases of pancreatic tumor. And this was specifically neuroendocrine, where the computer could not pick it up arterial and could not pick it up venous, but when you combine the two data sets with an accurate merging of the data sets, it was able to pick it up off that merged data. So now we're saying something we always knew. When you look at arterial, you look at venous, you look at the changes, sometimes the lesion is better seen arterial, sometimes better in venous, sometimes equal, sometimes not an arterial, only venous, sometimes only arterial, not venous. But you could see that perhaps we can merge things that if we're able to combine the data sets and get along, get around all of the problems we've had in the past. Remember, we've always th talked about combining data sets. Merging data sets is one of the promises in the 1990s, 1980s, 2000s. We haven't got there yet, but CN has worked out a way where it's more of a three-dimensional blending of the data sets. And I think then we may have additional information uh, in increasing sensitivity and specificity for detecting lesions like neuroendocrine tumors or perhaps other vascular lesions. So you see the point I'm getting to now is that protocols are really going to drive everything we do. Now, what you need to do is you need to be obviously doing the best protocols you can today, knowing that our protocols may change because if the technology changes and the clinicians need certain bits of information, it's important. Now, remember we spoke about radiology and the danger of AI, that if you're a film reader, if you're just someone who's clicking the dots, you know, and, uh, you know, RVUs, you know, ding, 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 like it's a damn slot machine in Las Vegas, you could be in trouble because at the end of the day, it's not going to be the volume alone that determines whether you're valuable or determines where you get reimbursed or how you get reimbursed. It's going to be doing the studies correctly to manage the patient. Now, we always talk about that even today, but I'm telling you it's going to be even more important. So if you're not doing the protocols right, your referring docs are going to have a problem, whether it's the pathologist, whether it's the oncologist, whether it's medical surgery, or um, the chemotherapy team, or immunotherapy. All of these things, I believe, are rapidly changing to the point that we need to make certain we're providing all of the information people need. Now, I think that one of the things, of course, is the referring docs don't really know what to ask for and truthfully don't really know what they need because this is new to us, but we may have a better handle on it. To the referring docs, be that in oncology and medicine and surgery, most of them don't really have an understanding or know what to do. So it gives us a great opportunity. If we want to push radiology and have radiology survive and grow in the era of deep learning, you're going to have to figure out a way of really getting involved and being at the lead of this process. Now, I can tell we're about a little more than halfway through the talk. So if you have any questions, perhaps this would be a good time to ask them. I think... Um, you know, one of the things when we spoke this morning, when I gave the talk with Linda, people did ask us about the protocol questions. People did ask us about, you know, the, the idea of sharing data from multiple sites. I think it is true, and there's some complexities for sharing things, and I won't go into that. But I think at the end of the day, one concern we have with protocols is even if I do the same protocol on a Siemens scanner, 
Will that translate to a GE scanner, to a Philips scanner, to a Toshiba scanner? That's a good question. I know that uh, Ron Summers wrote an article or presented a couple years back about deep learning for looking at lung nodules and how depending on the uh, scanner used, his accuracy would change. We did some work here on patients who had, uh, you know, typically is water as a contrast agent. Then we did some work on patients who had positive contrast in bowel. And you would say, hey, the computer must be smart. It can figure out bowel, and now it's targeted. It'll be better. The reality is the computer kind of got lost because it was seeing something it didn't see before. So even now, the protocols, do you give positive contrast? Do you give water? Do you give volumen? All those things are going to be critical. I know someday AI will be in a situation where what cont- would be great on every protocol every time. I don't think that's going to be the way it is for the uh, many, many years. So I think you need to figure out what's the protocol, do it time in and time out. You also can see why you need to do protocols correctly is from scan A to scan B. If you do the patient this way one time and the next time you get more delayed or something, the computer's going to have ta- a hard time, perhaps, figuring out responses. You want the studies to be exactly the same. Same AMMAS, same KVP, same slice thickness, same reconstruction algorithm. You would like combining time A and time B and time C and perhaps time D with the exact same protocols. I think that if the protocols will vary, then I have the concern that if you try to measure response to chemotherapy, you're going to have problems because it will not work as well, or you're going to make some very bad assumptions that are really not what you want to be doing. So I think that part becomes very, very important. So again, you can see what we're driving at here is we're saying protocols have always been important. You need to have precise protocols. I speak about not having uh, five different radiologists and five different protocols for pancreas, liver, kidney, spleen, and everything else. You need one protocol. If people can't agree, put the two of them in the Coliseum, let them fight to their deaths. You need to have one protocol. You can't have 17 pancreas protocols or two pancreas protocols. It needs to be one, and one is the only way you could do things over and over again. And in designing protocols, think about what you may be doing is what's going to happen in your practice. And again, I would say that this consistency and a lot of attention from the technologist to protocol and you work with the technologist become very critical. If you don't do that, I fear that as AI becomes in the picture, your data is going to suck. And then the referring docs are going to say, this is nonsense. We can't use this information because your protocols are not good enough. I do believe in the most part that most clinicians do not know, that means non-radiology clinicians, do not know anything about the scan quality. I've seen people say, oh, the scans look fine from another hospital. And to me, it looked like something from uh, the, uh, uh, some I don't know, some Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics or something. So I think that you really have to, take it on yourself, and be certain that you're scanning patients the same way every time. Optimize the protocol, perhaps, but do the right protocol time in and time again. So let's see. We're down to the last 60 seconds. What do you think about the possibility of establishing RAD system for pancreatic neoplasm? Um, you know, I, you know I, I'm not the biggest fan of all of these classification systems. I think people put a lot of effort into classification systems and not enough effort to do the studies right or interpreting the studies right. You know, we can come up with something for every organ and the, the way we're going, we probably will, but I don't see the clinicians that hot about it. I don't see ourselves that hot about it. I think we work closely with our clinicians knowing how they want things reported. We now classify pancreas into three different categories when we see them in clinic. We manage them accordingly. We look at outcomes based on that. We look at the expert systems where we need to be, the importance of being able in time to correlate radiology and pathology and use that as a way of defining the chemotherapy that should be offered to the patient, the length of chemo, when patients will be eligible to surgery, 
we're seeing more responses now with our chemotherapy regimen, and we are doing more Applebee procedures. Uh, so that becomes important as well. So the classification, it's like kind of a eh. Okay, now you asked the, so, uh, Christian, what's more correct? Firm delays or bolus tracking? The truth of the matter is, in theory, bolus tracking should be more accurate. But you know something? We spent a lot of years using fixed, using fixed delays, and I am telling you it works. Uh, there's less room for error. You know, you could say perhaps you might be off by a little bit, but I am telling you in the big picture, if you are busy and you use only fixed delays, in my opinion, you're not going to have any problem. I just don't see that being a problem. I think particularly with fast scan times, you just need to know how long to wait. But if you're waiting 30 seconds at 4 cc's a second, all the contrast is in before you even start it. There's no problem with getting delayed. There's no problem rather with Venus. Uh, all of these things become very, very critical. But I, I agree that uh, both ways work. But I think in terms of ease, a fixed delays tend to work even better in most cases. So that might be an answer that's not that popular. But um, we do we do a little of both. But uh, typically, a really good text. Pancreas, 30, 35 seconds, depending on the age of the patient or arterial phase, and then come back 30 seconds later in Venus. And that seems to work very, very well. So let's see, what other comments? Christian Steen has a comment, but that's a positive comment. So I think I'm running out of time. If you have any questions, take a look. Also, let me put a plug in for our um, AI section, which is really looking good. Lots of new material. It's on the front page of CT is Us. We are building it out. There's a lot of really cool things in there. And I'm going to add a lot of cool things this coming week from NVIDIA's meeting, which just finished in Santa Clara. So that'll be kind of cool. And also, I'm going to sign a contract tomorrow, if all's well, for our next course in Orlando. Back by popular demand, it'll be February, I think it's 15th to 17th, but it's the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We made it three days of President's Holiday Week. You can come earlier, you can stay later. But people were saying compress it and then expand it. But this way I think we'll get the best of both worlds. We're going back to the Swan Hotel. People liked that a lot. And they gave us a great deal, the same deal as last year, which was half less price. So with that, I'll stop there. I'll thank everybody for their attention. And if you come up with any questions, feel free to give me a call or write. And with that, 